Okay, so very punctually this morning, we might we might begin since since we're all here. Um, I just very briefly provide a few opening words. I don't, I don't want to take up too much time, but um, hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those of us across different time zones. My name is Ana Pertiera. I am at the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, I'm the Associate Dean of Research in our Faculty of Design, Architecture and Building. And um, I'd like to just welcome you all officially, I guess, now that the recording has started to this excellent workshop. We've held a workshop recently between colleagues of our two universities, um, the Catholic University of Chile and, uh, and the University of Technology in Sydney, um, last week in architecture and or the week before last in architecture and, and this week in design. And we really want to make this a fairly um, uh, close and friendly and informal conversation where we share some of the overlapping interests and ideas that amazing researchers from both sides um, of the ocean have. So uh, normally in, um, in Australia, we would um, like to, it's, it's traditional for us to acknowledge the um, custodians of our land. And so I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm coming from Wangal country and that the campus of our university is on Gadigal country. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our elders past and present and extend that acknowledgement to pay respect to any of our First Nations colleagues and students who may be joining us today. Um, we'll be joined later on by Jason de Santolo, who'll be coming late to our event. Um, so he may provide another acknowledgement when he arrives. What we're going to do today is um, just alternate speakers uh, between the two universities. We've got around 15 minutes each for uh, each person to speak, and we're going to be fairly strict with the time so that we have enough space at the end for questions and comments and conversation. Our first speaker today will be Martin Sidoni. Then we'll hand over to Jacqueline Goff. Then we'll go to Pablo Hermansen with uh, Marcela Mora. Um, and then we'll hand over to Cameron Tonkin Wise. Unfortunately, Camila Dios is not joining us today. She's sick, so we hope that she can join us in future conversations. So then we'll be um, handing over straight from Cameron to Jason de Santolo, and I'll just make sure that Jason is aware of that when he arrives, since he's coming straight from another event. He, he may not be aware of the speaking order. So without further ado, I'd like to just hand over straight to Martin to get us straight into the discussions and presentations. And, uh, we'll give you a reminder along the way uh, if time is running close, Clara will send you a chat message and then when we come to the 15 or 16 minute mark, I will be rudely interrupting with my noisy dog in the background. So over to you, Martin. Okay, thank you. Can you see that my, my presentation? Yeah. It's okay? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for this workshop between UTS and the School of Design of Catholic University. Thank you very much, Anna, for bringing this wonderful workshop. So in this presentation, I want to share some experimental thought around the notion of more than human design, proposing some element for a critical and maybe the colonial agenda to problematize the hegemonic paradigm of human certain design. Most of the reflections that I'm going to present today uh, are developed in a co-edited book called More Than Human Future, which will be available uh, next year with Rutledge and Pablo Marco is part of this, this book. So situated in the contemporary discussion regarding how to rethink design from a post-anthropocentric perspective, I will argue that the scenario of multi-systemic crisis that we are living demands a renewed capacity for design to make possible ecological futures. So in this presentation, I will try to address this need of decentering design from anthropocentric and colonial frame. So my presentation is we will organize in three parts. First, I will provide a brief context of how I started working with this idea of non-anthropocentric design. Then I will present some general element about our ecological crisis that forces us to question the supposition of the modern idea of design. And then I describe three displacement in an effort to move toward post-anthropocentric design agenda. 
So I want to start saying that the idea of post post anthropocentric design begins when with the work that we have done with Paolo Hermansen, who is here in the interaction design workshop in 2014, in collaboration with the National Zoo of Santiago. This research have, uh, that we have developed with the zoo consists precisely of questioning certain uh, supposition that are mobilized uh, in the human-centered design and trying to rethink the role of design to create interspecies encounters. From the beginning, we conceived these practices of prototyping in the zoo as a testing laboratory to speculate ways of relating to other species and entities. The idea was to try to transform design into a mechanism to generate questions and problems about how to situate design beyond human users, opening alternative way of corresponding with non-human using the, the notion of thin angle. Now, in, in another scale, the ecological crisis has generated an urgent need to examine the foundation of design. As several authors have shown, including the, the, the work of Cameron Tokiwise, who is here today. While the influence of humanity on the environment has always existed, many point to capitalist modernity as the accelerator of this anthropogenic dynamic of ecosystem transformation. Our capitalist modernity is inseparable from the process of colonization and its capacity to expand a particular understanding and valorization of the planet and all its non-human components, in which non-human are conceived as a mere resource for the satisfaction of human needs. From this perspective, Earth become an object of appropriation and exploitation, forgetting, as Tiningo would say, its condition as the foundation of all that lives. In his book, Facing Gaia, Latour addressed this disposition of the moderns to emancipate humans from Earth, denying the relationship of mutual co-interdependency between human and their environment. There is not question that the position that design has occupied in this context, context that I described is marked by its function as a tool for operationalize this specific way of understanding the Earth. Some authors argue that the modern colonial frame has imposed certain limits on the way in which design is practices, turning design into a negative ontology, that is design that, that does not problematize its strategy of production, intervention, and relationship that design establishes with the environment. So I will propose three displacements in a way to open the discussion that design can activate in order to contain or maybe respond to the ecological damage and move to a post-anthropocentric design. As you know, over the past few years, the idea of human certain design has invaded the practices, discourses, and discussion about design. The idea of user certain design does not only circulate on the main school of design around the world, but also become a standard to measure the good design. The human certain design that informs design practices is based on the dualism that understands nature as an object and society as a subject, establishing an instrumental relationship between human and non-human. But while user-centered design has created important contributions and innovation, everything suggests that this paradigm should be questioned in the context of our current environmental crisis. The complexity of the current challenges suggests that the notion of human certain and its focus on human protagonists is insufficient to think about and face problems that go beyond the dichotomy between nature and society and requires exploring 
more relational and planetary mode of projecting design, where design participants are not only human, but also non-human ecosystem. This preoccupation has demanded designers to move out of the comfort zone delimited, delimited by relationship between humans to describe and interpret the associations among multiple ontologies and exploring the notion of coexistence beyond human boundaries, as Isabel Stengers proposed. A design that is no longer oriented to a stable human entity, but that is open to all terrestrial entities, as Latour put it, in which the focus is on the ecology of human and non-human relationship that sustain the diversity of life. The second displacement that I will develop to unfold post-anthropocentric agenda has to do with problematizing the notion of futures that informs and has guided most of the practice of design. If we really want to take terrestrial design and, and the environmental crisis real, seriously, it's necessary to interrogate the dominant notion of future that govern the world of innovation and design. The concept of future that dominate is attached to a modern and colonial idea of progress, of human progress. Here, the future is synonymous with developments, emphasizing an abstract future emancipated from the tradition and the past. In that sense, one of the challenges is to explore a design future oriented in a post-dualist practices in which the future are not only for human purpose, but co-designed with more than human entities. That involves projecting walls in which human and more than human can coexist and reach and reaching each other in an interspecies process of correspondence. So if design traditionally point to, to how uh, point to how to achieve more human future, preferring white men and seriously impacting the nature of the planet, a challenge, I think, for decolonial design will be assuming that the future are not only are not exclusively designed by human or for human, but rather by, by multiple species shared with technology, technological agencies, plant, virus, telluric forces, rivers, tradition, and so on. So looking at wall making capacity of different entities is not only a call to humility in design, but also a matter of being open to redesign with other entities, new mode of sustainable futures. Thinking with uh, Emmanuel Cocha, we need to create the condition for multi-species and shared futures. Designing for more than human means moving from a techno-paternalistic logic that seeks to domesticate the planet and move a relational logic of world practices in which heterogeneous actors can collaborate to create interspecies connection. The third displacement that I will develop is linked to the, need, to the need to interrogate this notion of innovation. There is no doubt that one of the most persistent characteristics of the modern colonial design has been its fascination with innovation. The idea of design for innovation become a mark of contemporary design. As Carl Di Salvo says, today more than ever, design is put by the need to make something new to make something that did not exist before. But if we want to rethink the, the extractivist relationship that design established with the world, I think that we must to interrogate or question this idea of innovation. The, the problem maybe with this imperative of permanent innovation is that they leave aside other modes of approaching and getting, getting involved with the habitability of the world. Here is where the idea of care, maintenance, and reparation takes a central role 
as a political tool to project more sustainable futures or more, or more sustainable form of life. One of the challenges to the centering this anthropocentric and productivistic perspective of design is to begin to explore an ethic of repair that allow us as a, a that allows us an ontological redesigning of the unsustainability installed in our spaces. Developing a more ecological future cannot involve continuing to celebrate innovation and the, on, and the idea, very idea of, of project. Rather, as Latour has argued, it's involved taking, it's involved thinking about how to de-design, de-design, I don't know how you say, the unsustainable ways of life that we have created, calling for a radical ethic of repair. Inhabiting the world is not only about innovating and producing, consuming and extracting, it's also about caring and maintaining. So thinking about design from the idea of care implies paying attention to a more, um, hu to pay attention to a more than human network that sustains the life, evoking the form of co-design by multiple bodies. So to, to, to conclude, um, I think that moving design in the discussion of more than human future is an ethical uh, responsibility. Given the crisis that we are living and the collapse of the idea of progress, rationality, and universality, as the best and uh, standards put it, we need to prototype other world making, creating the condition for a just cohabitation among all entities that constitute our world. We cannot continue to impose our own criteria of habitability to other entities that also design the world. So how to do this transition using the world of talking wise? I believe that the most powerful capacity of the design are the ability to prototype possibility, potential mode of beings. Prototyping plays a fundamental role as experimental space in which to engage with the speculative figure of what if, as Mike Michael says, the what if is the way to generate questions and form of knowledge that are in process of being defined. I suggest that one of the conditions to move from human certain design to planet or earth oriented design is to use the capacity of prototype to invite other than human entity as a very matter of design. So con conceiving prototyping as a way of of exploring new ways of becoming with also involved the exploration of what standards and the best again called speculative gestures. That is alternative ways of thinking the relationship between human and more than human agencies that go beyond this cosmology of optimization and innovation. We should use the potential of prototyping to create future with future, as Tony Frey, Frey says, to go beyond what we know and closing those unsustainable futures. We could say that an earthly form of, form of design should, cre should create listening prototype. I don't know if that exists, listening prototype or diplomacy prototypes to coexist with other non-human designers. Thank you. I don't know. Thank you. That's perfectly on time. Very impressive. Thank, thank you very, very much. Um, what we're going to do is actually go straight through each of the presentations and hold the questions and comments to the end, because I think there will be so many connections um, and shared interests. So please um, hold on to any questions or comments that you may have. And um, thank you very much, Martin. We're going to go next to Jacqueline, if you're ready. 
I'm just trying to find my um, PowerPoint presentation. Just give me a sec. It was all set up and something's happened here. Okay. Just hang on a sec. Stop share. Okay, can you see that? Is that all okay? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. And you can hear me? Yep. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Anna, for organizing this and inviting me. Um, thank you for your acknowledgement. Um, and thank you, Martin, for starting us off. I do feel there will be a lot of um, connections across our work. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the deep conversations that could come out of this connection. Um, so I too would like to do an acknowledgement. Um, I acknowledge the Gadigal people, uh, the Wongal people and the Ngunnawal Ngambri people upon whose ancestral lands I live and practice. I pay my respect to elders both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land, recognizing that sovereignty has never been ceded. I acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and all First Nations people and pay my deepest respect for their continuing custodianship and generosity. In particular, I extend my gratitude to elders, knowledge holders and community who have welcomed me as I've undertaken this journey to understand the relational practices to support respectful representation in visual communication design always was and always will be Aboriginal land. In Australia, two centuries of colonisation has resulted in significant loss of biodiversity, the degradation of the land through extraction and a disregard for cultural relations and practices of First Nations. I posit that this sense of devastation is manifest in the practices of design and in particular visual communication design as the experience of awareness of unease when the designer in practice is faced with choices or questions of value in complex social situations. By consciously adopting an approach grounded in decolonization and respect for each other and the earth, I reframe the understanding of this anxiety. Being attentive to this experience of unease has the power to disrupt and transform what I refer to as design knowing and produces a design being through a relational understanding of situatedness and connection. The practice of relational designing and respectful representation that I describe here negotiates indigenous and non-indigenous perspectives with an aim to heal country and community through land management practices and education. As a non-Indigenous visual communication and information designer, the foundation of this practice is built on the experience of working with Indigenous-led projects, spending time on country with elders and community, working with Indigenous academics, artists, writers and scholars, investigating the history of colonisation, theories of decolonisation and decoloniality, and understanding the resistance and resilience of First Nations people. Central to this approach is the act of respectful translation, giving attention to the critical containment of the practices of interpretation informs the formation of a critical relational practice that decenters self and aims to replace self with place. At the time of European colonization, there are at least 250 Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander languages spoken across this large continent. These were distinct languages, not dialects, each with its own extensive vocabulary and complex grammar. This linguistic diversity reflects the diversity of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander culture, cultural identities more generally. This map is an interpretation of the language, language groups prior to colonization. 
For over 60,000 years, First Nations communities have been in relation with their country, specific places, recognizing that the health and well-being of all the entities in place is a custodial responsibility. The recognition of the importance of place is brought into awareness when working alongside First Nations people, and these insights are what inform the relational practices of the in-place designer as participant in the healing of landscapes and people. I'm fourth generation settler in Southeast Australia with Northern European heritage. Throughout my life, the unspoken history in Australia of the attempted erasure of First Nations peoples and disrespect for the land demonstrated by the willful extraction of resources, expropriation of land and appropriation of cultural knowledge with no acknowledgement has been a source of unease. I did not have the means to negotiate the complexity until I made a commitment to listen and learn about the resistance and resilience of Aboriginal peoples and to observe the power of the land, the mountains, the rivers, the trees to regenerate and survive in the face of the devastation wrought by the colonial project. The colonial, for me, the colonial project has created an unthinkable world that demands a way of rethinking and bringing to design being a realm that is different to the contemporary design knowing. Martin, have you know you've begun to pose the similar sort of question around the planetary concerns and how to deploy planet oriented design and your four points bringing design down to earth situating design decelerating design and recognize the intersectionalities in design focuses on the need that fosters more careful and ethical cohabitation on a da damaged planet my presentation has resonances with that work and it is heartening as we begin this dialogue between our places. I'm speaking from my experience as a design practice researcher, visual communication and information designer. And I will share some insights into my understanding that have emerged as I with elders, academic colleagues and students investigate this question. How do contemporary Australian creative practitioners and designers learn to live and work respectfully on country? The Indigenous-led projects that I will describe are directed towards the revitalization of Indigenous ecological and cultural knowledges and the care and repair of devastated lands where sovereignty has never been ceded. I share my methodological process and my commitment to cultural change through design. So much of my work, methodolog methodologically, I've been committed um, to research through design as a knowledge creating paradigm. It recognizes practice as significant in this process. Research through design refers to scholarly inquiry that systematically engages in professional practices of designing and it's value-based and is concerned with ways to negotiate the improvement of real world situations. Central to this research has been the influence of scholar Linda Tuhi Y. Smith and her book, Decolonizing Research. In particular, the responsibilities of the researcher working in cross-cultural projects and her description of the complexities of the insider researcher. So my research uh, holds these three um, investigations. Uh, one, the project, which is for, uh, today I'm going to talk about the Fire Sticks Alliance. Secondly, the research for design, which has been around looking at the responsibility of non-Indigenous designers and how they come to become or consider the notion of the in-place designer as a way to negotiate that. And the research about design has been to attempt to understand the protocols and processes that need to be in place in order to develop a respectful um, representation. So moving on to fire, um, which has been one of the key uh, projects that I've been working on, it's been a space of cultural change in the sense that settler 
Settlers have used fire, appropriate fire practices appropriate from um, Aboriginal people. Um, but it also, fire also has become a very threatening uh, element in our uh, culture. And it's, we've found that military um, uh, kind of strategies have been mobilised to stop fire, which is very different to how Indigenous people regard fire. Fire for an Indigenous custodian is um, central to the management of land, the caring for all the animals, all the plants, uh, and very different to the kind of practices that are undertaken in Western land management. In addition, these practices that I've been working alongside um, Fire Sticks Alliance to develop um, have recognised the importance of mentoring on country, um, visual storytelling, respectful representation. And my role has been to co-create a visual language, consider the design communication and strategy, and think about archiving protocols and um, dissemination tactics. This is an image um, from Yorta Yorta, which is where one of the National Indigenous Fire Workshops is held, where people gather together. So following Aboriginal protocols means that um, we're directed by traditional owners, um, our intention is to empower communities and to change the way that mainstream audiences imagine the threatening force of fire and begun, begin to understand the community-based um, benefits of working with the landscape. Um, one of the key things is centering messages around culture, country, culture, truth-telling and healing. So there's a lot of um, participatory uh, uh, engagement around the fire. Um, mentoring also requires on-country learning. It's something that cannot be um, taught through uh, a removal from being in place. I now want to kind of just bring you into the ceremonial um, space of fire. This is a video that we took um, that was taken when the Wurundjeri this in, down in Victoria lit up fire for the first time with approval from agencies. Um, and I'm just going to play this video to you. Just listen hard at the beginning to hear this. Also practice of nature of mind. We don't feel missed, you're losing everything. You're losing language, you're losing connection, you're losing everything. You must have your cultural practices. Little things, big things, grand boys. <laughs>
Okay, I'll stop there because I'm going to run out of time. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the kind of translation process that we've worked with over the last 20 years. So this knowledge transfer triangle that talks about the mentoring on country in order to have appropriate and um, uh, embodied experience has been the starting point. And this image that was done in 2010 is now currently being used in the um, mentoring program that FASTICS has set up and their goal is to mentor and ensure 100 fire practitioners in the next three years. It's a three-year program. So really trying to do a lot of revival. But these ways that these um, translations of knowledge become part of um, the practices has been part of my contribution. I'm just going to skip through these, but I just will come to this, which is another sign of the way visual communication has started to build um, a visibility around um, cultural practices. So the research about design that I've done has been this reflexive investigation around principles of decolonization. And it's meant that we need to ensure that we protect indigenous knowledges and we've developed um, intellectual and cultural, intellectual property agreements that recognize intangible cultural heritage, such as that moment that you've just seen in the um, video. Now, the research for design is where I really focused around the idea of the in-place designer and design being. Um, I, I'm going to miss, I, I, I've done a bit of an overview and I think Martin has beautifully referenced the problems of modernity and design. But around design being is, um, I think this is where we need to rethink how we're going to um, imagine how we are as designers in the world. Um, when you look at the way Western um, landscape and relationship to place is defined, it's around the physiological, psychological, and intellectual. And I think that by considering an Indigenous um, perspective, it brings a pluriversal approach to the way that we can consider place. So the in-place designer, I'm just going to, how am I going? Have I got another, am I able to keep going or am I going over now? Uh, you're, you're hitting time now, but if you'd like a couple of minutes to finish, that's fine, Jacqueline, because okay. we do have a bit more time. Okay, I just finish, I just want to conclude around um, this idea of the in-place designer that's emerged out of this research for design. Um, what happens in this model of the designer is the designer replaces um, self with place and place becomes central in their um, considerations in their working. So you end up with a, um, a decentered process where concern for the health of place is most significant. So as an overview, the in-place designer practices in context of relational complexity, replaces self with place, recognises the agency of the non-human, translates ensuring the fidelity of voice and decolonizes practices of interpretation. All of these activities require guidance from elders, knowledge holders and communities. So in a way, that's my um, kind of position that I've come to after these um, investigations through research through design. So thank you. That was a bit of a rush. No, it's great, Jacqueline. Thank you very much. And such a um, such a great continuation of some of the points that Martin started as well, um, actually through the detailed in-placed work that you're doing. So thank thank you very, very much.
Um, just a reminder, we're holding questions and comments to the end. So we'll move now straight to Pablo Hermansen and Marcela Mora, who will be presenting to us from Chile. Um, and I would just like to welcome Jason de Santola, who is here as well. Hi, Jason. Great to see you. Um, I just thought I'd let you know, Jason, that um, Camila Rios, one of the speakers, is unable to join us today because she's sick. So what that means is um, after Cameron finishes his talk, we'll go straight to you, if that's OK. Hi, Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Jason. OK, over to you, Pablo. OK. Hi, everybody. Uh, first, uh, sorry about our uh, Spanglish uh, presentation. In the slides, you will see Spanish sentences and, and in, uh, English sentences, but I don't know. We are in a strange world. Well, um, Oh, I, we, I need to share the presentation. That's a very important part of the thing. Let me see. It's OK? Yeah. yeah. OK. okay. So, Perfect. OK, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Uh, this video shows the Chilean pavilion at the 2021 London Design Biennale, designed by curators Marcos Chilet, Carol Laureta, Martin Tironi, and Pablo Hermansen. The pavilion entitled Tectonic Resonances from the South, from User-Centered Design to Plan-Oriented Design, in the same way that our dissertation will try to do, problematize the hegemonic ways of understanding and doing design. With Tectonic Resonances from the South, we will try to support that there are many ways of designing, or worldly. In other words, that design is not tragic or tied to the logic of the modern capitalist machinery. We understand design as the practice of renewing us and transforming us, reconocernos y transformarnos, a situated practice whose aim is to exercise capitalist modernity. By renewing us and transforming us, we take distance from design as a noun to embrace it as a verb formulated in the first person plural, an ontological epistemological ecosystemic more than human plural. Renewing us and transforming us are practical, critical, and spiritual capacities with perceptive traces. By prototyping ourselves, we apprehend each other humans and other humans, making possible a creative coexistence into each of the worlds that make up our planet. Renewing us and transforming us will is to dispute the general conviction and critically repeated in texts and exhibitions, seminars and conversations that design everywhere it happens is due to the European Industrial Revolution, which, like every revolution, has human and more than human victims, especially beyond the centers of power. Tomás Maldonado illustrates this idea by defining design as a, quote, creative activity that consists in determining the formal properties of the objects that, uh, that are to be produced industrially, imposing the binomial uh, in industry consumption as a compulsory step point for good design. Approaches like Maldonado yeah, are possible only if we restrict design to a mere modern discipline without its own ethical origin. In this line, the historian Ana Calvera proposes three hypotheses about the origin of design. She places the first origin in the English porcelain factories of the 17th century. Unlike crafts, industrial production requires prefigurating its results, which enacted a, a new role, that of prefigurator a kind of proto-designer. The second hypothesis adds a new duty. The prefigurator must add value. Calvera situates this on the Universal Exposition in London, where Victorian furniture was exhibited alongside objects of industrial production, opening a debate between arts and crafts and industry. Henry Cole, organizer of the exhibition, then raised the need to add socially necessary aesthetic value to the new objects, conceiving the designer. The third hypothesis highlights the international articulation of design as a guild, organized in the ICSID and inscribed in the develop developmental spirit with planetary will that followed the Second World War. European industrial designers constitute an armed wing of the, this capitalist civilizational project. A century after the Crystal Palace exhibition, the controversy between industry and arts and crafts has become history. The discipline of modern design was purely institutionalized and socially naturalized, said by Nicole Cross. Design ability is something that everyone has, to some extent, because it's embedded in our brains as a natural cognitive 
function. This map suggests that those excluded from this natural cognitive function are not a minority, but rather the norm. This distorted map gives the, the North a superlative importance, showing that, for example, the Iberian Peninsula and Bolivia have the same surface. Uh, Bolivia has almost double the surface than, than the, the, the peninsula. Uh, also proposes the national territories as discrete and homogeneous units, which makes the uh, invisible that even uh, within the so-called developed countries, only a part of the urban population enjoys the premises of modern developmental discourse. At the same time, its gradation of blue suggests a unique path towards progress. Uh, the materialization of modern discourse depends on the an, an idealized nature, always exuberant and available to be transformed into resources. One of the worst consequences of the Western colonization projects is that a group of human conquerors or ent entrepreneurs convinced of their exceptionality have managed to take control over the destiny of the world. Is it possible to reconcile with the exiles of capital? Uh, will we uh, be able to exercise the mode of production that deepened our planetary crisis from design? Looking for keys to answer these questions, we will go back to the dawn of the West, trying to identify the moment when the epistemological foundation of modern design are. We place our hypothesis on the origin of the Western design in the mid of the Gordian knot. For Robert Graves, the mid of the Gordian knot takes place in the region of Anatolia on a undermined date between the 20th and 16th century before Christ. Quoting Graves, the king of Phrygia had died suddenly, without issue, and an oracle announced, Phrygians, your new king is approaching with his bride, seated in an ox cart. When the ox cart entered the marketplace of Thomisius, the eagle at once attracted popular attention and Gorius was ominously acclaimed king. In gratitude, he dedicated the car to Zeus, together with his yoke, which he had knotted in the pole in a peculiar manner. An oracle then declared that whoever discovered how to untie the knot would become the lord of all Asia. Grace's account of the Gordian knot evidences its more than human composition. Gordius tools of agricultural production, his transformation from peasant to initiator of a new lineage of government in Phrygia, to revelation from Oracle, the gods who manifested themselves, their priest, and the conquest of Asia, since Gordium was the key to enter Asia because uh, his citadel controlled the only viable uh, trade route between Troy and Antioch. The not ordered this kingdom for around 15 uh, centuries. Uh, in 333 BC, Alexander conquers Phrygia. Propelled by the uh, Achilles' rage, he demands the custodian priest of the Gordian knot bring him before the offering to check if he was the conqueror of whom the oracle spoke. The knot physically, after more than 15 centuries, surely has become a dry set of rope, threads, hairs, and similar things entangled and intertwined in such a way that they, they cannot be separated. Nonetheless, Alexander devotes himself to unraveling the Gordian knot uh, to obtain the divine support for his conquering rage, uh, playing within the, the more than human pact, inhabiting the more than human maraña that the knot enacted. After trying and sex free to unravel the knot, he struck the knot with his sword and cut it in two, exclaiming that he had succeeded in untying it. Alejandro struck properly in an internally innovative design on ontological consequences. Innovating with efficiency, he submits this more than human pact by applying a modern epistemology that refines its nature. When he, stepping back, decides to snap the knob in two, he reduces the more than human marania to an object available to draw power from it. By dissecting the knob, it is reduced to mere object, while Alejandro becomes a modern subject of knowledge power. Following Willem Flusser, once the subject object relationship is established, conqueror and not are mutually constituted as ontological exclusive. Through his technique, Alejandro imposes a new order by applying an epistemological that will inspire countless military, scientific, technical, economic colonizations, among many ways of imposing power. 
we could describe the Anthropocene as a dense tangle of trajectories of conquest and colonization accumulated on, on Earth, and, and that today cover it so, suffocatingly, a globe saturated with innovative problem-solving trajectories. Unlike the Maraña that Alejandro faced, the scale and density of the anthropocenic one leaves no room to take distance on objectified it. The fate of the Western civilizing project is tied to that of those who had been exiled from their domains. Today, we live inside a maraña that no sword could cut. Modern design as a world control enterprise is today emarañada and emarañándose with that which exceeded. That cannot escape the reach of uh, th that we cannot escape the reach of COVID-19 corrobor corroborates the density of the tangle. Design described in the Alexandrian epistemology reproduce practices of conquest and colonialism. Design tools constitute the ethics of modern design, like the sword to the conqueror. How many, how, how to make the Anthropocene as short as possible? From the South how to kill the mythical mother industrial paternity? We have two cases that we would like to introduce you because two works to explain better why we need to design from the Orso de Maraña, that is renewing us and transforming us to navigate out the Anthropocene. First of them is one project named Quebrando Ciudades. In this project, led by Pablo Hermansen, Jose Guerra, and Marcela Mora, which is me, we work with ravenous or streams in cities and different wetlands in the north of our country. These streams work like ecotones between human design and wild environments and are hotspots for critical points of biodiversity. Those who inhabit these spaces redesign those things that were designed for specific functions by humans and for humans. This is, uh, this is the old flow meter of the Huasco River, which is just below the uh, Nicolasa Bridge uh, in Freirina. It is abandoned and it has not, no been used for, mad, for more than five years, at least not used by humans. This object that was designed to translate the riverbed to an, un, uh, to an understand it and to, uh, and to understand it, today serves as a maternity center for the fish that inhabit it. The fish divide into uh, different zones according to their, to their needs. The inner part of the uh, flow meter is used by the smaller fish, uh, by uh, fingerlings, which are uh, days or few uh, weeks old. The closest uh, outer part has a fence with moss and plants. This space is used by larger fish, but they are not yet big enough to go out of the central space of the river. The larger fish, large enough to avoid being hunted by birds or bigger fishes, inhabit the central space of the river, where after a small waterfall, uh, the space is clear of plants. However, the plants are on the side with optimal distance that, uh, that to take refuge in case of threats. This distribution allows us to uh, de decipher the, the large fish lay that eggs near the flow meter, once hatched, they uh, take refuge uh, in this space design in these days for them. It gets enough sun to grow moss and produce food, and it has the optimal configuration to protect them from predators, uh, has, uh, as only smaller fish can enter and live, and it has the perfect depth, depth uh, to prevent birds or cats uh, from becoming a threat. How it is possible? Uh, how can fishes give a better use of this place than seem uh, to be abandoned? Cases like these are very common in streams because garbage, abandoned objects, and rest of human design artifacts are thrown uh, in these spaces. The other word we would like to introduce, cast, is material conditions for an enriched relation and space with William Max. This work intended to contribute the social and cognitive well being of two male pumas who have lived in captivity for most of their lives. They live in separate but adjacent spaces through a fence, which serves as a meeting point between the two, favoring positive and social interactions and other not so clearly encountered. Once in captivity, the things that we can do is mostly contribute to their welfare. But how do we do this? We believe that from prototyping, we can identify and understand their singularities to get to know them as will and might. But for, from their singularities, and not as mere representatives of their species. First, a prototype was made that aimed to start a conversation without words. 
two ties and a rope allow interaction between the two enclosures. They did not play, of course, with each other, but when the sun reached the tie, it began to emanate a rubber smell that caused readers a pain. The big problem working with a sense and animal is to try to understand if the animal likes the smell or not. From science, usually different tables are used to evaluate the behavior if the animal moves a lot, it's positive, if not, it's negative. But how do we know if they move because they like or dislike the scent? How can we introduce new stimuli in a respectful way so they can choose whether or not to participate in the phenotype sensations? In this order, we started phototyping with different scents in the fabric barracks impregnated with aroma infusions. Green scents as rosemary or coriander, and floral scents as roses, lavender, and others. And this is what happened. Willow always chose the breads with floral scents. He is the oldest. And with his rhythm is fast, he walks slowly, and he washed everything very, very carefully. He chooses a scents that are just like him. Maki, in the other way, always chooses green scents. Their perfume is strong. He is the youngest, so he needs to smile like an alpha would do. I usually think of him as a male teenager trying to get noticed. So the smells he used give him power. He smells stronger than Willow. What happened then is that they found each other through the fence and start sharing a moment, releasing endorphins as they touch each other. Then Maki goes and wraps himself in the bread with flowers, essence, and tries to strike up a conversation with Willow in order to meet again at the fence. Today, Will and Maki share the same space and only vestige of the fence that used to separate them remain. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Man. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another uh, slide, but it, I don't want to use uh, too much about the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo and Marcela, and thank you for your generosity in the timekeeping as well. So we will move now um, to Cameron Tonkin Weiss from University of Technology, um, Sydney. Over to you, Cameron. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you. Hoping you can see the slide uh, with too many words on it. We can see it. Yep. Great. Um, uh, it's a it's a very exciting morning here, evening over there because there is um, a lot of really productive overlap. Uh, to some extent, I, I feel that what I'm about to talk to you about is a little behind where a lot of the discussion already is. So let me just preface it by saying uh, this is um, me trying to do some thinking through very much work in process as a result of things I've just been uh, um, reading and, and writing about just recently. So really looking forward to hear how this goes. Uh, it, it chimes, I think, very well with some of the, the claims that have been made. Uh, I'll preface it by saying, first of all, it's, it's within transition design. It's an attempt to think uh, in a kind of a causal layered analysis way or multi-level perspective um, in order to facilitate the transition to design or of design should we perhaps abandon the word is the provocation that I will end with. So I'm, I'm a little concerned uh, whether the word itself isn't limiting our capacity to um, uh, go with these transitions that we are already seeing in the talk so far. Uh, and, and I'm making a very inappropriate use of uh, Audre Lorde's uh, text there um, to kind of um, ask this, this question. Uh, and I'll just begin um, just with this um, quote from Yoko Kama, almost as like an, uh, uh, an epigraph, um, just to kind of say the, the way in which she names that design, as has been described already, uh, tends to refer to a neutral and placeless way of being. It tends to be a designing from nowhere by nobody, for everywhere, uh, for everyone. Um, she calls this dominant design, uh, but to some extent, she then says, or let's just say it's just design. And so to some extent, I think she's naming the problem that I'm trying to think through here. Uh, I'll try and read a little bit just to make sure that I stay on time and, um, and coherent. So I hope to make a contribution to decolonizing design or particularly decolonizing design education, which I believe is essential to uh, allowing us to transition to more equitably sustainable societies. 
as has already been described. Decolonization is, is not a metaphor, um, which means uh, there is no decolonization um, without ceding the discourse to those who have been colonized. And as a beneficiary, if not a furtherer, even if unwittingly of that colonization, my contribution could perhaps first and foremost be to just withdraw from attempts to lead the discourse. Um, and, and I think Jacqueline has usefully indicated the importance of, for example, indigenous led uh, in relation to this project. Another role which I'm risking um, is to use my privilege to criticize and undermine the systems perpetuating my privilege in order that they might more easily be displaced and not reproduced by those who have been colonized. And so I'm kind of referring to uh, hospicing modernity as a kind of project, though obviously there is a risk of recentering myself in that. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit because I think everybody is familiar with the importance of uh, decolonization uh, compared to post coloniality. Um, and just ask about this question of design's role in this. So we have heard um, some quite nice phrases. We, we need to, for example, uh, remove the, the um, hegemony of, of design, for instance. And I like the double genitive there. Uh, when we say sort of modern design, when we refer to the, the relation of design and colonization, the question I'm asking is uh, how Gordian knotted is design and colonization in that way? Uh, how much is it in fact actually the very essence of colonization? So design might be in its essence a form of coloniality and merely seeding design or design education to the colonized might see the continuance of that coloniality, particularly with respect to uh, uh, a non-human species uh, as we've been discussing uh, and the, the unsustainability of that way of defuturing. Decolonizing design therefore would mean not just the more than a metaphor of giving control of design education to those who've been colonized, but would further require a thorough transformation of what's involved in design. Decolonizing design must involve decolonized ways of designing. So to explain this, and this is where I start to be a little um, sort of regressive uh, as I try to kind of think this through. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of reproducing a historically Anna Calvera's uh, uh, typology that was usefully um, described uh, just previously. So I think uh, we need to differentiate design in its broadest sense of acting with intent, planning and action, which I'm calling deliberate design. We need to differentiate that from the more restricted but still general sense of producing artifacts, perhaps built environments, and even the processes that make use of those artifacts or take place in those built environments, which I'm calling making design. And then this third, which is the very specific sense of the commercial practice of design services, taught in formal institutions of learning, such as schools and universities, which I'll call professional design. Now, obviously, as you can see in this picture here, professional design refers to processes that are primarily European in origin. The modern profession of design was formalized just over a century through the establishment, for example, of the Bauhaus in Europe, though that institution is perhaps just the most explicit version of modern designing, synthesizing explicitly or in parallel other attempts to regularize technical training in the arts. Um, so all of this was an attempt to kind of think about production. Just sorry, by the way, I, I did have the great opportunity to go to the Bauhaus in Dessau. I was there with a Dutch architect who was being very silly. He, he created a chicken coop uh, just outside the Bauhaus. And then at one point the chickens escaped and got into the Bauhaus. So it's a nice uh, more than human moment uh, in relation to modern design. It feels like the sort of story, um, the late, uh, and really I miss him, Bruno Latour would have used as an anecdote in some, some lecture sometime. Um, okay, from certain perspectives, it's not just that professional design, this modern professional design happened to be most successfully institutionalized and commercialized in Europe and particularly the Anglosphere the primary source of colonization against which decolonization efforts are directed. There are ways in which design is axial to colonization. Consider for instance, that modernism's explicit deliberate design was to break with all existing traditions and constitute a new universalized version of the human. 
this is what I mean. It's not, it's not just that design was used by modernism as a way of doing colonization. The project of modernism by design was explicitly colonization. Uh, the detraditionalization of all locales and the replacing with the universalism. It's kind of obvious, but in a, in a way I'm sort of saying whenever we, whenever we say design is kind of hegemonic and, and a form of colonization, we need to still like identify what that phrase entails. Modernism was initially an intra-European colonization by design, and then with the globalization of capitalism, in the second half of the 20th century in particular, this became an extra European form of colonization, redesigning toward uniformity, the homes and work of the global consumer class. There's a bit of a problem with this argument, obviously, which is that European colonization begins before European and globalized modernization by design in this professional design sense. So it's the difference between the modernism of the post-industrial revolution, art applied to manufactured goods, and the modern period, the kind of pre-enlightenment uh, and, and reformation versions of scientific rationality informing the birth of modern capitalist economies. And again, I'll just pick up here that very nice phrase um, from Anna Calvera of the Profigador, uh, the kind of uh, idea that you know from the 17th century you had what could be a fourth definition of design, let's call it um, um, production design or machine design. This is the kind of making that most critical philosophers of technology refer to, mass machine products, uh, some with their own mechanics as afforded by the specific specification of identical components, something that was only possible uh, by systems for manufacturing materials into standardized, more or less pure forms. So the commodities of coal, oil, lumber, steel, glass, ceramics, textiles, etc. The form of these products was less important than the more aesthetic concerns of professional design. Those aesthetic concerns initially motivated by modernist edification, then by marketing in the US with the streamliners, and then with user-centered design, as we've discussed with Martin. Key products of this machine design are, of course, weapons and their pair locks, it's the same mechanism uh, as Tony Fry has written about, and the components for modes of transport and quick construction of defensible housing. These of course are all absolutely central to the actual violence of colonialization. And then the whole thing becomes a positive feedback loop. Machination requires commodities, which necessitates seizing resources through colonization, which requires the production of machined goods, and so it goes. The cycle, however, suggests in the way I've just described it, the machine design uh, is not just an instrument of colonization, but a fundamental part of colonization, if not the key to colonization. So if machine design is inextricable from colonization, what does that suggest about professional design? Well, certainly Eurocentric is professional design in turn inextricable from coloniality. So there are perhaps three possibilities. Professional design is a neutral process that just happens to have been dominated by Europeans and used for colonization. Professional design maintains at its core and perhaps extends machine design's coloniality. So post-colonial design would just perpetuate that coloniality. Or there are aspects of professional design that exceed, resist, or redirect machine design's coloniality. And these afford opportunities for decolonized designing. There's a kind of transition possibility within. Do we actually have to cut, which we can't, from professional design? Or can we find things in it uh, and, and listening prototypes, for example, can we find these things in it that would allow us uh, to transition? Uh, this kind of second one, the one that suggests that design is ineluctably colonial, uh, has these kind of characteristics, use of commodified, if not made to order materials, as I mentioned, abstractly framed problems, dismissal of existing responses to those problems, data-based research, rather than kind of uh, contextual qualitative inquiries, decontextualized designing in a studio, a separate, not going to country, as uh, um, um, Jacqueline talked about, uh, universalized evaluations, does this uh, benefit the most, imposed results through regulation, monopoly, or marketing, kind of globalized capital. 
The third one's the ones within professional design that might hint at decolonized design might be the intimacy with material constraints and tendencies, wicked problems that require uh, dialogue mapping, uh, actual conversations, uh, Ezio Manzini's account of design for social innovation, where it's all about the designer finding existing solutions and just helping them, not coming up with the new, again, as Martin described. Participatory and collaborative design, pattern-based designing, unfinished designs, which I've written a bit about, open and legible designs. These are all occurring within professional design. And I'm asking this question of whether they offer uh, um, opportunities to redirect professional design away from colonization. This, however, is not straightforward. Consider the first one, which is that intimacy with material constraints. And again, picking up the, the previous discussion of craft. Design training in some specialisms more than others does still involve acquiring a felt knowledge for materials, though rarely in their place-based specificity, not going all the way to their provenance and, and exploring um, the bioregion from which they come. These moments within design practice are often characterized as the craft of design. In some ways, I think this is an oxymoron. A well-established tenet of design theory is that design arose by deliberately distancing itself from craft. So this was the work of John Chris Jones, Chris Alexander, uh, numerous other figures, for example, uh, during the design methods movement in the 70s. Alexander, for example, um, describes craft as an unself-conscious process of evolution. It's more or less random modifications that have to be field tested before being deployed. And then if they work, they're reproduced until something in the environment changes to require their random modification again. By contrast, designing in Alexander's famous formulation uh, happens self-consciously in abstracted virtual domains where multiple changes can be explored, you can do creative leaps, and they can be evaluated in that virtual domain without needing full-scale field testing. Now, this conceptual distinction certainly captures what is distinctive and powerful and colonizing about professional design, drawing attention to the particular efficacy it accessed, one that enabled the great acceleration, one of the, the nice accounts of the Anthropocene, for example, or capitalist scene or plantationist scene. However, in Chris Alexander's account and John Chris Jones and consequently many others, this distinction that captures the power of professional design is dependent upon a deprecation of craft as a blind and mute process, with examples drawn from non-European, always non-European and pre-modern instances of what I characterized before as making design. So this is problematic. This would suggest that while there's craft within design, this reproduces a colonial distinction, a colonialist distinction in ways that may limit its capacity to be a pathway forward to decolonize designing. I just suggest by the way, uh, I wanna make two comments about this. The first is, one way forward might be to pick up Malcolm McCullough's argument about what he refers to as a digital craft. Um, and on the one hand, this means the way digital systems and environments can be, see, be perceived as having an aliveness, a resistant materiality, even animistic tendencies. And on the other hand, it points to the necessity of sense-making in context of complexity, crafting uh, what, um, um, Nora Bateson calls warm data. And I'm, I've just put on the screen here these very interesting dialogues that occurred between Dave Snowden, um, wealth complexity thinker, and Tyson Younger Porter, um, uh, just considering uh, there were kind of four different yarns. I've just given the citation for the first and the fourth here. They're all online as transcripts. Very interesting discussions about sort of complexity in a very sort of post-industrial sense. And of course, Tyson's version of understanding uh, indigenous knowledges, um, which are not always shared, but just very interesting sort of moments in which you can see something other than material craft. But the, the real point I wanted to make comes from the fact that I was working through Dave Graeber and, and Dave Wengrow's um, um, 
the dawn of everything. And obviously this distinction between craft and design uh, has been shown by them, not in their words, but I think their argument shows that this distinction is a hierarchy between pre-modern non-European craft and modern European design. This distinction is part of a Togosian developmentalism that has been central to colonization, to both the conceptualization and the framing of colonization. What they do in this book is indicate that the archeological record shows tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years of communities around the world making very deliberate decisions about the kinds of society they wish to make durable, to use Latour's uh, definition of technology. To call those practices documented in this book, craft, underplays their politics. However, uh, if deliberate design and even making design are being confused these days with professional, machinic, modern colonialist designing, perhaps it's also not helpful to call them design. So what then should we call them? So I'll just finish by just pointing to uh, Alfredo Gutierrez's work um, in which he tries to describe this problem, what, what might be these designs with other names. And I'm here just again quoting Yoko Akama's work. And how might these renamings begin the process of unlearning central to decolonizing design? Uh, Alfredo um, is playful, obviously, with this and recognizes uh, this exact challenge um, that uh, these kind of uh, decolonial struggles will be unsuccessful if the same name design is maintained. Uh, as a result, uh, he comes up uh, obviously with a ridiculous proposition. So at some point he describes all the different types of design of the South, designs of the South, designs others, uh, designs others. Uh, designs with and by other names, and then takes this as a kind of acronym to say perhaps we could name decolonized designing this something other than uh, professional machine colon colonial coloniality design as decibons. So I'll just leave you with a, that as a closer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cameron. What a rich <laughs> talk. The ideas are piling up on one on top of one another. Um, so we'll move now to Jason De Santolo, who I'd like to welcome. Um, and I just uh, let the speakers know that um, we'll we'll be making some time at the end for conversation. But we do understand that some people may may have to leave more or less on time. But I'm certainly available to stay on a little afterwards for some further conversation and invite those of you who are available and want to to, to do so. So it's over to you, Jason. Thank you very much. Um, no. uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, just like to firstly um, thank you, Anna, for this opportunity and uh, acknowledging um, it's wonderful to be here with colleagues and friends from Chile and um, just acknowledging wonderful, you know, friend and colleague Jacqueline. So nice to hear more about your amazing long decades and decades of work coming through and the in-place designer work and um, acknowledging the amazing relationships that you hold with our communities and have hold, have held for, you know, for so long and how difficult it is to hold those relationships in an institution that just wants a bunch of uh, grants and publications and a whole lot of other things that often don't match um, the importance of those relationships. Um, also, yeah, acknowledging Cameron and um, and others here. Um, yeah, my name is Jason DeSantolo, and I'm currently the Director of Indigenous Research at the School of Business here at UTS. I'm not a businessman, um, but yeah, I've, I've managed to land a really wonderful job working with Robin Quiggan um, in the business school. And uh, we're working on sustainable finance solutions for First Nations and also a major project around protection of indigenous knowledge in the academy um, and beyond. Um, today, just wanted to focus on um, a little bit of a talk about the idea of for the Ijan. Um, and this talk, you know, really 
uh, as part of a long, very long conversation I've been having with my elders, um, my Garawa and Yanua elders up in Gulf Country, Northern Territory, which is right up in the Gulf. And, um, I just uh, up in the Gulf on this map, just for colleagues, just where the Borolula, that is uh, where our homelands are. Borolula is a township that was established uh, in the early, uh, late 1800s. And it is home to four major tribes or clans, Garawa, Yanua, Mara, and Gadanji. And Yijan really means dreaming in a, in, a, in, a, in a most fantastical and vibrant way. It really means all life. Um, it includes the cosmological relationships all the way to the stars, through the waters, the lands, and all of our relations as animals in the living and non-living world. I'd like to acknowledge all of the traditional owners and custodians of the land, the Gadigal and Wongal people that I'm here, situated on um, all elders past and present, and also all First Nations people who may be here or may engage with this work in the future. Um, I'm just gonna be reading as well, just to keep to time. Uh, just like to pose um, also the idea of Two Laws. Um, Two Laws was a documentary that was collaboratively made in the late 70s with our elders um, in Borolula. It, create, it created a, a massive shift in documentary filmmaking. Um, and it was made by Carolyn Strawn, who sadly recently passed away, and Alessandro Cavadini. Two laws asserted the strength of Aboriginal law in a way that has resonated with a new generation of land and water protectors, continuing to shape and reshape present day unification strategies for shielding Southwest Gulf country and the Northern Territory from the onslaught of extractivism. Decolonizing design must, in my mind, challenge extractivism in its ethical sense of becoming. Uh, this image is uh, of the Two Laws uh, DVD cover, um, and that's one of my, my traditional mothers uh, who uh, passed away last year. Um, but I just really want to acknowledge all of the leadership that our women have played um, in this work, Two Laws, and subsequently in Wabada Bunanu, which was another film that I made with the community. Decolonial futures is about healthy relationships to the land and each other. Colonization is by design. The extractive nature of design is inherently overt, yet still to be understood. And, you know, I'm really grateful for the insights today and especially the in-place designer work of Jacqueline. There are many other more experienced First Nations practicing designers and knowledge holders, the new Associate Dean Indigenous and DAB, Alison Page, um, and Lucy Simpson, who is an amazing designer, uh, ULA designer, who is also doing a PhD in the school, are two examples. Um, but today, I just really wanted to share a bit of insight around the work that I've been doing with my elders and Gadrian Hosen, who is a, a community leader. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge, you know, the long-term collaboration work with Adjunct Fellow in the School of Design, Nadine and Dixon, and, um, and Jacqueline, of course, with Firesticks. This talk is really part of a long-term conversation, as I said, around the idea of two laws, Aboriginal law and Western law. This film really created an important documentation of the importance of those laws and a liberational framework for the idea of legal pluralism and land justice in Australia. My work aspires to Indigenous self-determination, the protection of country, and communities and the supporting of indigenous community-led research on country. At UTS, we center our research on indigenous self-determination and the exercising of our sovereign rights to protect our homelands and all of our relations. We are dedicated to long-term relationships for future generations. Even though indigenous studies is seen as a fledging discipline, in reality, the theories and methodologies we work with are thousands of years old. They are deeply place-based and transformatively responsive to shifting conditions. Our own theories and methodologies and pedagogies 
are able to holistically encapsulate and navigate these complex shifting landscapes of life through a deep understanding of the workings of these natural systems. I believe wholeheartedly in the importance of indigenous research, not only for liberation of Mother Earth, but also for, for understanding ways to navigate the crisis of social disharmony and radical climate impacts. Indigenous knowledge systems are fragile and need to be protected as much as the rights of governance and representation in political forums at national levels. The recent State of the Environment report is an excellent example of this being recognized in relation to climate crisis. Through a decolonizing design lens, our work is engaging with land justice based movements for the Yijan. Reimagining the outstation homeland movement through a decolonial futuring proposition where decision making on country on our traditional homelands is exercised to its full effect as autonomous zones. At this point, I would like to acknowledge the inspiration and leadership for some of this discussion around Indigenous Autonomous Zones from Chile's Harmonization Com Commission, you know, and the, our international relations, the Mapuche, and the drafting proposal of a new constitution that very sadly was not approved in the plebiscite in July. Yet we now attest to its significance for all peoples, marginalized communities around the world as a magnificent document and movement for transformations into a fairer and more sustainable society. I also acknowledge the work and collaboration of scholarly practitioner Juan Salazar. What is the potential of a two laws proposition in the conceptualizing of legal pluralism in Australia? What is the role of decolonizing design in shifting perceptions of indigenous jurisdiction and autonomy in an era of treaty making? Can decolonial futuring propositions help us here? As Linda Tuiwai Smith states in her third edition of Decolonizing Methodologies, we must get the story right now. As, and just as Australia grapples with truth telling, we are also facing climate impacts and in mining induced contaminated environments. To narrow down the talk, you know, can design be more truthful? And if it can, how can it attest to the, you know, how can it understand and work through the extractive practices that it is founded on? Will it form alliances with First Nations justice movements and help set new conditions for transformation? Uh, this image is uh, one of my traditional mums who's a, a leader for us. Jungo Nambala Naru Naramba Yajina Yogamba. Um, this is one of the proverbs that has driven a lot of our work in the last couple of decades, the idea that we will sit peacefully in our lands forever. Um, and if you see in these images, uh, you might not be able to see them, but uh, my nephew there has double water painted across his chest. Um, this is a, a new class of land warrior that is coming through. Um, uh, and I want to acknowledge Dr. Sean Kierens and the work that he has done with our elders. Jason, do you want to just move to presentation mode so that the slide is full oh. screen? Just go to presentation. Sorry, is that better? No, just press that. They're getting better. No. Can you see it or? Yeah, we're just seeing it sort of not full screen. Um, I don't know where you've gone there now. Go back to where you were before. Oh, that's all right. Leave it. You've now got double score. Oh, there you go. Down the bottom, there's a presentation mode. Okay. Down the little um, project sort of projector thing, third icon in. Anyway, maybe don't worry about it. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, there you, you go. Full screen now. Perfect. Beautiful. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, the second. Sorry, I, I should have. I should have done that earlier. Um, the second elder and the, the second uh, provocation is um, the idea that white fella law changes like this wind. He's a, a you know amazing leader, um, um, Wongli, Uncle Jack, and he uses uh, visual imagery and design to challenge you know extraction and colonization in, in our communities. And in, in, in our film, he talks about the idea that white law is just consistently, constantly changing to suit you know, to suit the, uh, the agenda of the current um, government. Yeah. 
this, uh, this image is uh, reflective of uh, the importance of coming together. We have here representatives of Pacific and Māori peoples from around the world. We're at the front of uh, Glencore doing a protest against the destruction of our homelands and contamination of our waterways through the MacArthur River mine. And the idea of Gajamogu is one as a principle that has been embedded into our methodologies, our creative methodologies that we have been using for a number of decades. And the idea is that Gajamogu, we all come together under as a as a as a united family against these. And I just want to acknowledge that we have seed representatives, the Indigenous Climate Youth Activist Group. We have Indigenous uh, the First Nations uh, Justice Team from Get Up. We have representatives of the Environmental Defenders Office and others here represented. Um, one of the main propositions I've been talking about in these series of talks is the idea that extractivism is relational. Um, you know, and, and often I think the idea of being responsible for what we what we engage with, um, and the idea that. Uh, um, you know, for extractivism to work, it must enter our bodies, it must enter our minds, and it must enter our lands. And it's a two-way street. Extractivism also extends state violence. The notion of state violence um, is attached to leadership and to people making decisions. Um, during the COVID uh, crisis, the government chose to invest $50 million into fracking companies and the exploration of Northern Territory Beetaloo Basin. And in my mind, that's a genocidal act. Um, the new Labour government has just invested $1.5 billion into a petrochemical plant on the outskirts of Darwin. So just as we have water wars continuing in the Northern Territory, we are seeing that the energy crisis is driving the destruction of homelands and um, the destruction of the Yijan. In proposing a two laws project, we are reimagining jurisdiction. You know, we are sort of reimagining the idea of jurisdiction. Um, and as Linda Tuiwai Smith talks about in her latest edition, decolonizing methodologies is about knowledge related critical practices. It's the practices that we are undertaking as part of the as part of our research. And as part of our um, our custodial rights over the land, this image is an important image from Yugawal, from from our traditional mum and elder. And this is a celebration um, image acknowledging the hundreds and hundreds of years of trade with the Macassan people that our peoples had. And through that trade, we traded technologies, um, we traded stories. Um, and sales and um, all sorts of things. The sophistication around that peaceful exchange is a model for, uh, for future relations in Australia. And finally, for the Yijan, the idea of uh, a decolonial futures, you know, re, you know, as a research design proposition, um, Gadrian has, asked, has been asking me to, to share the statement and I won't read it in the interest of time. Um, but I think, you know, one of the most important things um, is that he talks about a voice to parliament means no voice for us. There is still no voice for us today. It tries to take all the power away and take it to parliament into a Western system of power. Why is that? Well, it is because decision making is on country, on land. And for the Ijan, you know, the idea that we should source, you know, the, the important point here, I think, is that power, political power should never reside solely in parliament. The future well-being of the Ijan of all life is determined by this. In these times, it is now in greatest jeopardy since invasion. And finally, I just thought I'd share um, a couple of um, references, um, you know, a really great proposition from Gadrian, the idea that what happens when water is death when you're drinking contaminated water. Aileen Morton Robinson's work, uh, which, which basically extends her white possessive um, uh, 
uh, the white possessive notion um, and, and acknowledges the importance of indigenous ontological dimensions to sovereignty. Larissa Barrett's work in, uh, around story as law. The Doctors for the Environment Australia, How Climate Change Affects Mental Health in Australia is a significant report which states that 80% of Australians were affected by the wildfires of 20, 2019 and 2020. The State of Environment report, which I mentioned, includes Terry Jankey's work around protection of Indigenous knowledge as attached to the climate crisis. Uh, Linda Tuiwai Smith's work in, in the third edition. Um, Nadina and I have written towards design sovereignty um, as part of the work we did in the School of Design and the series of talks we did in colonization by design. And of course, Jacqueline and I uh, got to write a paper, which I think is really significant in terms of engaging with local pedagogy and the design, you know, the decolonizing design practice and education. And then finally, um, the Dance of Waters um, was included in uh, the Biennale publication that was done by um, Jose Roca and Juan Salazar. Um, just to end off on a, hopefully a, a hopeful, <laughs> a bit of a hopeful image. This is my son um, pre-COVID and we, we traveled up to, to my homeland and um, we went to a very special place called Wangalali. And Wangalali was a campsite in the wet season and it was an educational site. And um, anthropologists and all the people that have been working in our communities had never been taken here. And a lot of them are really, really pissed off that they never got to see this place. And it's only really come out more recently. And we went there with the elders. And straight away, my son went straight to the site and started to grab the stone and start to grind the ochre. And then from there, he would start to mark the paintings. And there were paintings there that are thousands of years old, marking the Macassan's relationship as a way of um, teaching. And I think, um, I think, you know, I'm really inspired by our young people. And, you know, my time in design school really inspired me to know that um, we have some really great young practitioners and scholars coming through and um, to do this work uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jason. Yeah, great, a great image to conclude the series of talks on. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to thank other parties, other audience members who've joined us today. It's really great that you've been able to come for the conversation as well. And of course, like true academics full of ideas, we've, we've gone a little bit over time. But what I'd like to do is just open the floor to the, first of all, to the speakers who spoke today who may have been holding on to thoughts and ideas that they'd like to share with the group um, about each other's work. Um, I think we can stay for it for at least another 15 minutes or so to have that conversation, but understanding some people may need to leave, but for those who are available, please stick around for another 10 or 15 minutes of conversation. Um, if there are other participants who wanted to add a comment or a question into the chat, the chat function is also open. And if anyone wants to add a comment or a question in Spanish into the chat, written into the chat, we can also translate that. Entonces, si hay, si hay gente que quiere poner algo, algún comentario o pregunta en español en el chat, que está bien y lo podemos traducir también. Okay, thank you. Uh, who would like to share some comments or questions from the speakers today? Um, I'll, I'll jump in just to kick things off. Um, first of all, thanks to, to Jason's presentation. I think, I think when we have these kind of discussions and, and then there is the, the presentation of the kind of um, pressing um, political urgency um, of decisions being made quite literally uh, in terms of the destruction of land and water in, in the way Jason described, I think it, it's always an important, um, an important reminder of, of what is actually driving these types of conversations. Um, I wanted to I wanted to just raise something uh, which I mentioned previously as I was talking, but just as a question, it's a question maybe for Martin in particular, because that's where I first heard it, but it was across a lot of the presentations, Jacqueline's as well. So there was a an account of um, earth-oriented designing uh, in, in Martin's account 
um, drawing on a Latourian rather than a, a, an indigenous uh, account of, of country, for example, in, in this continent, but related. And a lot of that was about uh, what I would describe, Ezio Manzini once called it the sort of gardening. It's not about designer's production, it's designer's reproduction. It's repair, it's care, it's not the new. And, and I felt that there's that tension, there's that in tension with the other side of design, which is we need something completely different. What we've got at the moment is just not working. Like we, we absolutely need to um, get away from this current framing. Uh, and, you know, prototyping, experimentation, speculation, these are, these are the tools that design uses to, to break and jump and disrupt and open. And I wondered about that tension between repair and gardening and not doing the new and this trying to create spaces for the new. And I wondered if that is a tension, if anyone has a suggestion for the way in which it's not a tension. Um, and it was just something that I heard across the various presentations. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Cameron, for your question. And, and also thank you for the, the other presentation. It was very inspiring. I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think there is a, a wonderful discussion about if we need distraction, we need transformation rather than rehabilitation or caring or repairing. But one of the things that for me is, is, is important of the notion of repair, that when you repair is because you need to care to, to, to carry what you have in face to you so you need to know very well you know you need you need to to be a, a amateur to love what you are in face and so maybe sometimes the problem of 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 design is that they don't stay with the trouble they don't understand what they have in face so so maybe the the action of repair implies to know in a very specific and, and systematic way uh, uh, what you are dealing with and, and becoming with the thing that you have uh, working with. And so I think that the, the, the notion of repair can sound a little bit uh, reactionary or co conservative, but I think that uh, the, the, the notion of care or, or repair implies to be involved with the problem and stay with the problem rather than impose something completely new that we don't know. Uh, and so in, in every action of repair, there is a, a kind of inventive uh, gesture or innovating practices. And yeah, so this is one, one, one question. And the other question is that, uh, answer is that yeah, prototyping sounds also uh, something very uh, common in the in the in the world of market and entrepreneur or I don't know uh, self make people who who is doing something new, but I think that one of the the main uh, powerful of, of prototyping is that the goal of the prototyping is to fail. So uh, the, 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 the main purpose of prototyping is to fail. Is, it, and, and if it's not fail, uh, you have a product. And, and so, and, and maybe one of, one of the things that we need is to, is to, to have it at the, 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 the failure, to how we can think through fragility, how we can uh, design from, Carrying to be um, uh, permeable to 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 things to to uh, this is why I really love the, the notion of corresponding of of Tim Ingle who, who said if we want to carry our disaster with the planet we need to learn how to corresponding with things and I think that prototyping uh, have this magnificent 
a, a characteristic to be fragile and so can be interacted by many things, species, uh, and so on. I don't know if someone wants to, to, to say, to, to add something. Just a quick note that uh, a colleague of ours, Jesse Adam Stein, is running an event in July next year, which hopefully will also be available online and has secured Tim Ingold to speak about repair. Um, oh, really? In fact, yeah, July next year. So it'll be interesting to see that. Well, no, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I I have a, a um, maybe a yeah a comment uh, maybe for Cameron and and Jacqueline uh, because yeah I I am I am completely agree that uh, that the implementation of modernity cannot be separate from uh, the colonizing process. So it's this kind of inseparable uh, movement, and 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 design. We can situate design in this process, in this operation, and this movement. And we need to redesign this uh, uh, movement. But uh, one of my one of my my problems sometimes with the notion of uh, decolonized design is when in the, in the same concept of colonization, you have uh, inequalities, you have oppression, you have segregation, you have many different concepts. And sometimes the notion of colonization uh, invisibilize this other operation that maybe we need to, to identify each operation that maybe come from the same process of colonization. But yeah, this is my, my, my comments. Jason, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I just return to uh, you know, the elder scholar of indigenous story work, Joanne Archibald's proposition around how important it is to get story ready. So be prepared to tell a story. The idea that we can just tell stories or design something in our world, in the indigenous world, you have to have a relationship to that story and the responsibility to enact and tell that story takes work yeah. and in Australia we're not ready for that story you know if we're talking about justice and truth reconciliation or any of these things the truth telling uh, we're not ready and similarly you know Linda Toy Y Smith talks about getting the story right is incredibly important yeah. so I think um, I think a lot of those projects have been affected I just know um that it's not reaching communities the conscientization process which graham smith talks about the idea of um setting conditions for transformation can design and can designers contribute to setting those conditions for transformation is my question Well, I know that I, for a long time, couldn't use that word decolonizing. I mean, it was something that um, I didn't feel um, equipped to participate. Um, and although I was working in Indigenous projects, um, but it's, on, it's only really been since I kind of have started recognising the responsibility that we have and what our relations are to um, the values and 
what how we want to move things forward. So Jason and I started framing up ways of people having roles as like activists, advocates, um, witnesses. So starting to give opportunities for people to start thinking about where they stand next to issues. And decolonizing, like, I mean, we're all colonized. There is, you know, and this is, it's a very big project. And that's why I think in the work that I do, reflexivity, you know, deep internal work has to be done in order to kind of even open the possibility of a conversation. And, you know, it's only in association that those conversations can really happen. Um, and that's why I'm so grateful to Jason and the elders that we've worked with and the people, you know, Victor and all the communities that I've associated with, you get a sense. And look, there's no singular outcome here. So any universalizing here around the idea of, you know, decolonizing or decolonialism or it isn't, it doesn't work. It's we are in a place at a certain time where there are certain conditions and we need to consider choices at that moment. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about uh, Cameron's suggestions for those three positions, I mean, I'm hanging around the third position, very happy to, you know, investigate that one. Um, and I think, you know, there are ways that design, it doesn't have to be rethought. So I am a bit of a conservative. I mean, you know, I can see the trajectories. I try to bring a pluriversal perspective to that, recognizing the Northern Hemisphere's influence on how we think about it. But as artists, creative practitioners, we do all need to negotiate the politics around that work. Um, so I'm very, I was very pleased to see those three things you know, and I'm really happy, I'd, I, you know, that third one, I think we have got work to do together, maybe. Yeah, I, I like, I like, uh, let me, let me take this idea of rejecting uh, universal concepts, you know, I, I think that that's a first step, but this step uh, must go to a deep epistemological uh, change, yeah. and a change to I don't know where, you know, it's a, it's a change that we, we need to create. And that's why prototyping, you know, with other than humans, with other than Westerns, with other, other state of conscious is so important to, to, to be able to open epistemologically, you know, to possibilities that, that we don't know. And in this, in this resistance, in this revolution, I don't think, I don't think it, 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 it has some, a specific plan to follow to 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 resist, but I'm sure that this this resistance that knowing uh, renowing us and 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 transforming us is is a way is is something that begins and happens in the body. I, I let me think with uh, Paul Preciado, you know, and thinking that uh, we are not just uh, colonized by. Uh, conceptual or, 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 or theoretical structures, but by pharmaco, you know, powers, you know, that constitutes the way our bodies grows and re, and, re, and, and, and then uh, I think that uh, the, 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 the way I, I think is, is, is our way, at least in, in, in our lab, in where dice lab or dice, is to experiment from the body, you know, experiment in, 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 in ways that we cannot explain before the experimentation happened, you know. Uh, and in that way, if you get open to a trans ontological criticism, you know, not an ontological, not closer to, to, the, to the classical modern epistems, maybe you can take some distance. And in that way, this uh, quality of design of uh, reflecting and transforming materiality and, and transforming what you perceive as uh, the surrounding, I think is an excellent uh, way to, to do it. But 
what what I think is is just to, because I think we we agree in many and many many aspects, but what I think is very different from my point of view about, for example, uh, original nations or, 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 or original nations in Latin America is that 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 our situation, if I have to describe our situation, the Mapuche. Uh, almost civil war now is that it's impossible to describe it in a uh, I don't know hygienic you know in a in a in a in a pure way is emarañado is entangled with a lot of uh, radical forces you know the Mapuche resistance is not a it's not only a poetic resistance but are uh, narco narco are involved you know. Uh, timber stolen things are involved, you know, uh, old, uh, you know, political resistance are involved. It's a very dirty, and I like dirty uh, territories, you know, it's a very dirty territory. And I think in that way, uh, we think that this from the body and in situated in our bodies is very important to feel this uh, dirtiness, you know, and, and, to, and to be able to experiment this dirtiness through this uh, re-knowing us and transforming us, you know? Um, and in that way, I think we, we, we as, as a, uh, designers, uh, the researchers through, through design, we have a lot more questions than answers. You know? and, and, and I hope this, we can experiment together. Yeah, I stop myself, I can I could skip the thing forever. I think um, Marcos had a question, and I would just note if if people have not seen the chat, there are a number of references there, and excellent call for papers from Melissa Duque. Thank you very much for that. Some other references in the chat too. Marcos, did you want to contribute something? Yes, yes, I'm going to be super, super brief uh, because we are completely on on time, and so I'm going to say thank you very much. It has been a very. Do, do you hear me well? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it has been super interesting. Uh, I think I'm going to dream about those chickens centering the Bauhaus. I think it's an amazing, amazing image. Um, a little bit apocalyptic, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> but it's it's quite interesting. And we have in 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 in, in Uruguay we have a president called Felipe Mujica. Maybe you you know him. Uh, and Felipe Mujica, uh, he's a very wise man and um, very down to earth. I, uh, he has the same car the last like 20 years and he has all kinds of uh, modes of not buying any new design. So if you see his house, basically his house is nothing, there's nothing new uh, inside. And it's, it's still he's, he's uh, quite an interesting guy and quite connected. And he sets, uh, something about governing. He said, um, governing is the art of trying to do this and this and this and this, but in the meantime, or meanwhile, we are going to do this and this and this and this. So basically he said, we can all agree in what we want. We can all go in the same direction, but really the art of governing is the art of the meanwhile, what we do meanwhile. And my question who do whoever wants to answer, if there is an answer or maybe just silence, is taking this uh, Audrey Lord provocation of, can we dismantle the master's house with the master's tools? Or in this case, can we dismantle the uh, designer's house with the designer's tools? Um, even if we can uh, solve this um, question, it's not going to be easy to dismantle the house. And what can we do meanwhile? That's my question. It, it's a it's a beautiful question, beautifully phrased question. Um, I, I, my I I don't really have an answer except to say that one of the ambitions of transition design was precisely to take from transition management, this really horrible Northern European socio-technical innovation management discourse, but to take from that, this idea of multi-level, that it is very necessary to do multiple things at the same time. 
And and one of the things about doing that is it's it's about being in a state of hypocrisy because it is necessary to be working in one complicitly while trying to resist it. The point is not to validate complicity, but to kind of say almost with a trade-off log logic, what are you doing to undermine the system if you find it necessary to be doing things that are propping up the system at the same time? So you, you, you can't just use hypocrisy as an excuse. You have to do both actions at the same time. And that it's a very difficult version of subjectivity it's a very interesting proposition for designers who tend to be very one project at a time oriented and who tend not to be very good networkers showing solidarity you know with with people at the front of anti-extractivism at the same time as trying to um, do more than human listening prototypes for example so I can't answer other than to say it is a beautiful formulation of what I think design politics is and, and what transition design aspires to begin to create tools to do. I'll, I'll just, um, I mean, what one thing that I think in terms of uh, academia is um, if we're gonna show care to, people who are being oppressed and the subjects of these discussions around colonization, then we need to extend that to the point that we create a fairer labor, you know, a fairer labor kind of um, society where we have black and indigenous people on the same jobs that, you know. So I think the institutions really need to step up and create fairer conditions in workplaces and um, and beyond. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that in different ways, all of the presentations that we've enjoyed in this conversation have been examples about what to do meanwhile, in the meantime. And um, whether it's through the teaching, through design in place, design practice, through working alongside other people, whether it's all the different ways in which um, I think the examples of work and thinking together, doing design work and doing design thinking together have, have been exemplified here. Uh, uh, a great start to the answer of, of, of Marcos's question about what to do meanwhile. And, and another thing we will do meanwhile after this conversation is, is to think about what comes next for us in terms of these workshops and, and, and conversations. And they, they may or may not, Jason, include some forms of grants or publications, <laughs> but they won't only be that. <laughs> so um, I wonder if people are comfortable with my closing this session now, because I sense there's a lot more that we could say, but I'm also aware that people are juggling many things. Some people finishing their day, other people have a full day of work to get on with. But um, this has been such a beautiful uh, encounter. I'm so pleased that people have taken part and, and really thankful for everyone's contributions from what was a fairly spontaneous and loosely organised event. Um, maybe that's the best way to do it sometimes. I'd like to particularly thank Glada, who's here as well, Glada Rodriguez, who's helped us with all of the organisation. Um, she's just been impeccable in her assistance for both of the workshops we've held. We're going to continue this conversation. I'll send some emails in the next couple of days. Thank you, everyone who has participated. If anybody wants to say a final word of thank you or goodbye, please turn your microphone on. But on behalf of all of us, thank you very much to all of you. Muchísimas gracias a todos y todas. May this be the beginning on behalf, rather on than the end. Of, yes. On behalf of the, the Pontifical Catholic University, the same words. Uh, thank you very much to, to Clara, to Ana, and to everybody that uh, participated. And hopefully we can, we can continue this uh, dialogue for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, for me, yeah. Thank you very much for all the presentation, and it's really amazing to see how a lot of resonance with the things that we are doing in the school in Chile, and so I think that we need to to steal this conversation 
And so we, yeah, we are going to work to, to, to try to figure out a, a founding or something to do together. We're, we are yeah. just across the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Thank Adios. You. Bye. Adios. Ciao, ciao. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias.